Hey, Farmer's Branch family. It is time again for Bible study from the big comfy chair. I'm sitting here pulling up our text for tonight. We are in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. So get your Bibles. Your beverage of choice. And let's begin to learn what Paul is talking to the Romans about. Now you recall last week that we did, uh, we finished up with the first chapter. Let me just go back to that for just a little bit. Started with the, uh, uh, we finished with the first chapter that talked about God's wrath against a sinful humanity and how that all men, including Gentiles, Jew and Gentile alike, all people, uh, had no excuse for not honoring and believing in God and not honoring him as God. And because of that, we see the, the world fall into sin because they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, etc. You remember the lesson last week. Now, it, it, it does occur to me that there's a little bit of a clinical aspect to what Paul is saying. And as a clinician, a former clinician, I see clinical things everywhere, but I do think Paul here is talking first in the opening of this uh, letter to Rome, as, uh, and we'll stay in this thing for a while, and what he's actually describing is the pathogenesis of sin. Now, pathogenesis is how disease forms, and, uh, and, uh, and the process by which it takes to express its features as a disease. And, and so he's talking about how does sin come to infect the human situation, the human condition. And he's talked about, in general, the pathogenesis of sin beginning with refusing to retain God in one's knowledge. And that's true across the board. Now, like many diseases, uh, its pathogenesis may differ from class to class, from race to race, from individual, certainly from individual to individual. And there are some condition, underlying conditions uh, that can alter the course of uh, the pathogenesis of a disease, how that disease forms. For instance, uh, partial treatment, partial but incomplete treatment with antibiotics can alter the course of an infectious disease, a bacterial disease. Uh, and, it, and it can make the pathogenesis a bit less typical, maybe more complicated, maybe more insidious. Um, so he describes the general pathogenesis of sin here, including the Gentiles. But then he moves on to the more complicated, perhaps, the, the bit of the different manifestation in those who are given the law. And it becomes a bit more complex. And he goes through great pains to take uh, believers to the Old Testament to see uh, the basis for the expression of the disease of sin in those that are both without and with the law, speaking of the law of Moses. And so let's go through here and see why this condition of sin is common to all men, those with and without the law, and, it's, and, it's, and it can never be remedied through the law. If it could, the people under the law would already be free of their sin. But we're gonna see, even in the, from the Old Testament, that that is not the case, that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
And that's a line from moments that we will get to in our study. So we've talked about, in general, not retaining God in uh, our knowledge and how that in the final passage of the first chapter, although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, his thought doesn't end with this. In fact, he picks it up immediately as we go to the second chapter. Understand that the chapters are just artificial divisions. They're not really natural breaks in the thought or the, the, the continuum of the letter. So we begin tonight. So we're going to have to hold that thought that I, of the passage I just read, the final lines of um, the first chapter, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You, therefore, have no excuse. Speaking to the Romans, and particularly, as we'll find out, speaking to the Jews among them. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Now, the basis for passing judgment is the law. You, it, we'll find that one does not pass judgment in absence of a law, especially human beings. It says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, here meaning the Jews. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. You know, you are sinners just like the Gentiles who are without the law on the same basis that they are sinners, but you have done it under the law. And he will begin to expound on that. And, he'll, and he's going to put out layer by layer his systematic theology of sin and forgiveness. Now, it, it, people, the casual readers of the book of Romans will misunderstand. They find it disjointed and they say Paul jumps around and but he does nothing of the sort. Uh, Paul here is very systematic and, and, and goes through a tedious exposition based in the Old Testament. You make a mistake if you just read these lines from the Old Testament that he will quote and fail to go back and look at the source of that quote and look at the context in which that source occurred. He's talking to people who are very familiar with the Old Testament. And all he has to do is quote one line and immediately the tone and the wording of the entire passage comes to mind. It's sort of like if I were to say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. As a reference to that blessed hymn, you would no doubt bring to mind all the rest of the words of that beautiful hymn. Well, he expects his readers to not only not to take the line that he quotes as a proof text, but go back and we, and we will need to go back and understand its context and what the larger passage is actually telling us. So we'll be doing it. We'll be reading a lot of the Old Testament in our study of Romans. So it says, now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. What such things? All those things we read in Romans, the first chapter. He says, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Now he's about to return to this thought. He's going to add another thought to it, but we're going to see both of these things addressed in um, the Psalms here very shortly, because he's going to reference the Psalms as well as the proverb uh, in this. And we're going to see what, what he's, get, he's, he's getting up to here. We're going to see that he's really talking about a condition of the heart, not adherence to a written law. But he's talking about God's kindness. 
It says, Lord, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Not just the Gentiles, but the Jew as well. He says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. And then, his, this is where he quotes from the Psalm and the Proverb. It says, God, quote, will repay each person according to what they have done. Now, people who penknife this out and you try to use it as a proof text often make a terrible mistake because when they take this just as an isolated statement, they take it to imply that it is adherence to the law and it's works by which we are judged. It's by what we actually do that we are judged. Well, we're going to find out that that's what, what, what it's talking about is a bit different than just physical adherence, that it's a matter of the heart. Now, we can prove that just with the next couple of lines, but what we really need to do is go back to the Old Testament. Let's go and find out the context of where that's quoted in the two places that it's quoted. And first, it's Psalm 62 and 12. Now, we're going to read the whole 62nd Psalm because you really need to know the context in which the psalmist will uh, make this statement in line 12. So if we go to Psalm 62, and I'll give you time to get there because I'm going to have to go there too. Psalms 62. This is a Psalm of David. He says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this teetering fence, tottering fence, teeter. Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths, they bless. So they're not sinning with what, by what words come out of their mouth. It says with their mouths, they bless, but in their hearts, they curse. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. This is kind of the chorus to the song. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they're nothing. Together they're only a breath. But do not trust in exhortation. I'm sorry, do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. For one thing God has spoken, two things. I have heard, what two things? The first one, power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. Because Paul first mentioned neglect of the love of God. But the second thing, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. Back up in the text, it says, with their mouth they bless, but in their hearts they curse. And it's that condition of the heart that will be rewarded accordingly. Now the second reference comes from Proverbs. Twenty-four, and again it's line twelve, but we need to read its context. Proverbs twenty-four. And let's go down. 
to 13. So this is saying 25 in this string of Proverbs. And, he's, and beginning with verse 10, he says, If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing of this, does he, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? He does not. Does not he who guards your life know it? Let's read that again. But if you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Or in this case, not done. There's no outward appearance of sin here, but the heart is seen by God that they did not protect that brother in peril. So now we've established that the quote in context is not talking about adherence to any kind of list of rules or written law. Being repaid according to what one has done is a matter of the condition of the heart. As we said in our introduction and in last week's lesson, that the Christian ethic, that the law of Christ dictates that if you've hated a brother without cause, you've already murdered him. You don't have to pick up a stick and hit him in the head. If you have looked on a woman with intent to commit adultery, whether you actually carry out those plans or not. It's immaterial. You have already, you are already guilty of the sin of adultery. So it's a matter of the heart. It is a matter of intent. It's a matter, and, and the one that sees our hearts rewards us accordingly to what we have done in our hearts, not necessarily with our hands. That's a sobering thought. It should be. So let's now go, now that we know that he's not talking about by what you did or did not actually physically accomplish by physical effort, but he's talking about a condition of the heart, let's go back and see how Paul describes what you do or don't do in this context. So if we go back to Romans, So let's go back to the fifth verse and, and read so we get all this in context. It says, but because of your stubbornness, well, let's go back one more. It says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Back to the words of the Psalm, 42nd Psalm. It says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourselves for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God, quote, will repay each person according to what they have done to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. He doesn't mention here keeping a set of rules. He's talking about an obedience or a disobedience that is deeply seated in the hearts of men. He says, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Well, if it's first for the Jew and then second for the Gentile, it seems like that's an inferior class of citizenry. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that that grace first came temporally in time. When Jesus walked the earth and he 
made the statement that we are here but for the lost sheep of Israel. During that period, he brought this gospel first to the Jews, and it was largely rejected. He says, now for the Gentile, but there is no difference at this point. So it came temporarily first and then second. Not, um, and so at this time, it's come to us all. And there is no difference because he says, for God does not show favoritism. Now that's not in keeping with a lot of uh, Jewish belief. And, and I'm not saying every Jew on earth believes this, but this is generally the teaching of the rabbis that uh, Jews are the sons of God and the Gentiles are something less. Yeah, that's just a, that's just a harsh truth. I'm, and I'm not being anti-Semitic here. Please understand that that is uh, the teachings of the Talmud. That those are the teachings of the Talmud. That uh, that the Goyim, the nations, are not are spiritually inferior. But God says differently. Now he goes back to showing material equivalence then from all who sin apart from the law as well as under it. So in the 12th verse, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do, not, who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them Sometimes they do things that twinge the conscience. And at other times, their thoughts even defend them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my, do as my gospel declares. So it says, whether under the law or not, if you do by nature those things that are written in the law, you're justified. But you can keep every commandment. You can keep every little tenet of the law. And if your heart is not pure, it didn't do you a bit of good. And so he will later make the case for that whether keeping the law of Moses or not, we're all sinners. And that it, the law, in fact, has something to contribute to sin. And that will be a little complicated. I won't, I won't unfold all that right now. But so he goes on. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have the law, in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, and do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, Do you show sacrilege in the presence of idols? And that's really what this phrase, do you rob temples, means. Do you rob temples? Do you show sacrilege in the presence of idols? As it's written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Okay. He quotes the Old Testament again. Now, 
just this line doesn't really carry the whole weight of what this line represents. So we need to go back again and look at context. Because as my mother is fond of saying, a text without context is a pretext. So let's go back, let's go find out where he's talking. Now, this is gonna be a little bit more complicated because we see this language uh, arise in both Isaiah and Ezekiel, but the wording is obscure in Isaiah unless we go to the Septuagint. Now, I know you don't have your copy of the Greek Hebrew scripture, uh, but I'll go there. It'll take me a little bit to get there to Isaiah 52 and 5. I will go. Give me a little time. And we will get there. Okay. Isaiah 52. Awake, awake, O Zion. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your glory. O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and unclean shall no longer continue to pass through you. Shake off the dust and rise up. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Take off the bond from your neck, O captive daughter Zion. Because this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing and not with money you shall be redeemed. Thus says the Lord, formerly my people went down into Egypt to sojourn there, and they were led by force to the Assyrians. And now, why are you here? This is what the Lord says, because my people were taken for nothing. You marvel and howl. This is what the Lord says, because of you, my name is continually blasphemed among the nations. Therefore, my people shall know my name in that day because I myself am the one who speaks. I'm here. I'm talking about the coming of Christ. And it's a scathing, blistering indictment that these, the holy people of God, cause the name of God to be blasphemed in whatever country they wind up. Now, God's also saying there's an end to this. And it's not in restoring the dignity of those holy people. It's in giving them Jesus. People that are looking for some type of salvation of the Jews apart from Christ, John Hagee, you know who you are. We're going to have to do that flying in the face of the prophecies of God in the very words of Christ. Now we can go to our translations based on the Masoretic text to look at Ezekiel's language. And Ezekiel tends to say things in a, as, as disagreeable a way as possible sometimes, in the most startling, poignant way as possible. Um, he tends to use stronger language. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. And you, you should, you, to really get the flavor of this, I'm, I'm, I hesitate to do that tonight because we're going to run a little long anyway. But let me just read the, oh, it says, Son of Man. And often in Ezekiel's prophecy, he's referred to as Son of Man. Son of Man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, Mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The enemy said of you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Now, let's skip down a little bit. It's better than read all of it. Because this is talking about 
the restoration of Israel, just like that last, uh, this is the parallel to those words we just read from Isaiah. So if I go, if I begin reading in 16, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. And while we're on that, let's just say there's nothing inherently unclean about that, but what it represents to God, every time a woman's menses comes, that means that egg that she produced in her ovaries and migrated to her womb, passed on through without fertilization. So it represents lost potential. That when God, when Israel did not live up to the expectations of her God, God was horrified by that lost potential that, rep that that represented. That's why the parallel between those two things. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. And when he says shed blood here, He's not just talking about their violence, but he's also talking about the sacrifice of their children. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And when, wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore say to the Israelites, and of course there's that, back up there is, uh, is that uh, language from uh, Romans. He judged them by what they had done. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. So the point that Paul is making here is that all this is for their salvation. because he picks up in 24 and he says, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. Beautiful words of salvation. Go back to Romans. Romans 2. So, we go back to the 25th verse of Romans 2. And, he, and he's pretty much wrapped up that particular idea that he's trying to present, but his systematic uh, unfolding of this systematic theology, of this theology of Romans, is still ongoing. And he's not jumping around. He's doing it in a very stepwise and methodical way. If you don't really understand the tone of the idea that he tries to establish with these 
brief quotes from a familiar, passage of scripture that's very familiar to people, some, certain people in his audience, then you, you get the idea that, why does he skip around so much? He's not really skipping around. And so here, the 28th verse, uh, I'm sorry, we haven't got there yet, in the uh, 25th verse. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you become as though you had not been circumcised. Now, what's he saying here in light of what we just read? That the disobedience of Israel throughout its history had made it such as if they were never even circumcised. They didn't have the physical um, evidence of the covenant that God had made with them because they had not kept the law. Indeed, he'll make the case here that no one, in fact, uh, can keep that law. It says, for then if those who are not circumcised keep the law requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? Again, he's making a very strong point that this is not about the flesh. This is not about merely men's actions or their outward appearance. That heart of flesh that Ezekiel talked about. He said, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and circumcision or lawbreaker, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God, the one who sees the heart, the one who knows our minds is our judge. Now, we're going to return to this next week, and we're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to say that this is not something new. This idea that uh, the circumcision of the heart is not at all a new idea. We'll see it in Deuteronomy. We'll see it elsewhere in the, in the prophets, and we'll go to a number of places where God has already told them long ago that I, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. I deserve a merciful heart rather than adhering to the letter of the Levitical Code, even when it comes to my sacrifices. You know, in other places, he says, your circumcision is a circumcision of the heart. And that really just never caught on because they did not know where the law was pointing. Now we have Christ, the fulfillment of the law. We're going to return to this next week. In the meantime, take care, Farmer's Branch.